individual people having their own mission of life, I feel is highly egoistical and self-centered because we have… we are just a minuscule in this universe. You know, uh, this planet, planet Earth, is a speck in the larger cosmos. The solar system itself is a small speck. Tomorrow morning if it evaporates, nobody will miss it in this universe, that's how large it is. In that larger speck of solar system, planet Earth is a micro speck. In that micro speck, we are sitting here in Doha, it's a super micro speck. In that super micro speck in this cosmos, you are a big man or a woman, this is a serious problem. We have no perspective as to who we are in this existence. We are too full of ourselves, so we have missions and ideologies and all philosophies and all kinds of things. We are too small to make any conclusions about the cosmos. We are too microscopic. I'm sure you don't have a microscope powerful enough in contrast with the cosmos to see who a human being is, it's too very small. But the beauty of being human is, we cannot uh, grab everything in the universe, but if we are willing, we can perceive everything in the universe. It's only what we perceive we know, rest is all imagination. Maybe locally makes some sense in every society, whatever conclusions a few people have made, because all of them agree to those conclusions, looks like it makes sense, but in the larger perspective of life, it makes no sense. It is only what we perceive and if we only evolve tools for enhancing our perception, that we will know this life better and there is nothing else can drive any of us except life itself, the phenomenon of life the power and the beauty of what life is. It's not for you and me to make individual traits of it, it's for us to experience it and express it and reflect it in every possible way. Sadhguru, in this mad race for economic development, are we missing something? <laughs> uh, so we need to understand this, economy or the commerce. Commerce should serve human well-being, but slowly we are turning it into a huge giant where human beings are serving commerce. Commerce may refuse to serve humanity after some time if we don't graduate it properly right now. Particularly with all the women getting into the economic activity, this is the time to understand and regulate commerce in such a way that it serves human well-being, it doesn't work against us, commercial forces. Why I'm saying this is, uh, I'm constantly moving around with policy makers and business leaders, the short-sightedness of their vision scares me sometimes because right now we have created an economic module where if we succeed, we will fail. When I say this, you know, in the year 2008 when the economic recession was just setting in, I was at the World Economic Forum and uh, they asked me to handle a session. This session was titled, uh, Recession and Depression. Because all the economic leaders, uh, you know, most of them, almost all of them are billionaires in their own right, but they were all carrying long faces, depressed, because uh, in the last three months they had lost a few billions. It's all on paper, of course. Nothing is lost from this planet, everything is here only. Nothing evaporated and went away. <laughs> in the paper value of things, something was up, something was down and there was a huge depression in the mood of the economic leaders. So I said, uh, recession is bad enough, uh, you don't need depression on top of it.
But anyway, the way we have structured the economic engine today, the way it is driving, if we fail, we will be depressed. If we succeed, we will be damned. So it's better we fail or we re-engineer the whole economic process on this planet. Today, in many ways, uh, I'm without any prejudice to anybody, I'm saying this. Every nation and every society in the world, knowingly or unknowingly, are aspiring for a life. Economically successful life means uh, to live like an average American. The Living Earth Statistics says that if seven billion people on the planet start living like an average American person, you will need four and a, four and a half planets to service this economy. But we only have half a planet. I want you to know, half is gone. We only have half a planet, but we are driving towards using four and a half planets, which we don't have. The other planet we can use is some light years away. So, our economic module has to re-engineer itself. There's a very prominent proverbial uh, story in India about a man sitting on the wrong side of the branch and cutting it. If he succeeds, he will fail. That is the kind of module we have set up. Our idea of success is being one step ahead of somebody else who had already made a mistake. So, uh, I think uh, particularly women entering business areas, a complete rethinking about what is success, what is well-being, what is good life, has to be recrafted, otherwise we're heading for destruction. I'm sorry to sound like this, isn't it so? Could you advise on how a leader could acquire vision for his leadership uh, to bridge the gap between vision and reality? What are the steps? Vision and? And, and uh, manifestation, reality. the reality. Okay. Yeah. So when you say you're a leader, by any standards, business or otherwise, a leader means you have the privilege of sitting on a perch a little above others. If you sit in a higher place than others, and if you don't see better than others, you'll make a fool out of yourself. You have to see something that others cannot see. If you don't see anything new, if you don't see anything fresh that others cannot see, for sure you will become an object of ridicule. So vision is an important part of being a leader, that you are able to see something. Vision does not mean you concocted an ideology. Vision means, literally means you are able to see something that others cannot see. So when you are seeing something, if your vision is seeing something, it will never be in conflict with the existing reality. Only if your vision is… Uh, from the libraries of great universities in the world, <laughs> then it may not have connection with the reality in your existence. Otherwise, vision means to see. If you are seeing, how can you be disconnected with the existing reality? But I know where this question is coming from, because for most people their vision comes from books that they've read are something that they have concocted in their mind because they're supposed to have a vision. <laughs> no, vision means to see. I think for ages, we've always uh, credited women being more intuitive or more visionary for which they were burnt and killed and uh, battered for so many things because they could see something that others could not see. <laughs> so, a woman has had a I'm sorry uh, if it sounds bad, I'm only saying it in a certain context. A woman has had a privileged position where she could sit back and look. Man was in the thick of action, not seeing anything, day to day race with somebody else, kept him busy that he could not see anything, dust in his eyes. 
But woman sat back and looked, not involved in the activity but just looking and seeing. So she saw things that others could not see. She developed capabilities within herself where she could see things that two eyes could not see. When you say an oracle, you think of a woman, not a man. <laughs> men also, but uh, generally in the world, if you say intuition, if you say somebody is an oracle, somebody is a… could see something means generally the image of a woman comes up. This is for many reasons. Are you interested in other reasons or just in social and business reasons? Hello. It's a question. Other reasons, okay. This will need a little uh, rejigging of your logic because this is of a different nature, what I'm going to speak now. <laughs> In the making of the human being, <clears throat> who we are right now, the form that we have taken, is a product of the solar system in which we exist. In many ways, the solar system is functioning like a potter's wheel to bring this up. There are beautiful uh, examples or analogies for this. The Adi Yogi, the first yogi, over fifteen thousand years ago, when his disciples asked him, can't we evolve further? He talked about evolution. He talked about evolution. Fifteen thousand years ago, not hundred and fifty years ago after Charles Darwin came, he said, first the life upon this planet happened as fish, then it became a turtle, then it became a wild boar, then it became half man, half animal, then it became a dwarfed man, a, then a full-fledged man but volatile in his emotions, then a peaceful man, a loving man, a meditative man, the next one is supposed to be a mystical one. So he… when he spoke about this, people around him naturally asked, so can't we evolve further right now? So he said, unless there are drastic changes in the solar system and the way it functions, you cannot physically evolve further, but you can evolve in your consciousness if you're willing. It's uncanny that in recent times, somebody was introducing themselves to me as a neuroscientist here. I, I don't know who it is. Okay. Neurologically, a lot of research has gone into this in the last six to eight years. And the same question has come up. Can't we have a bigger brain than what you have right now? How many times you thought the men around you, couldn't they have a little bigger brain? To anybody around you, this question comes up and uh, when this question was posed and a lot of research was done in this direction, what the neuroscientists came up with is, see if you want to have a bigger brain or brain capacity, there are two ways. One thing is pack more neurons inside, which means you may have a higher level of intelligence but a lower level of clarity. A whole lot of children are born like this, more brain cells than they should have. Initial phase of their life, they are very disturbed and agitated or hyperactive. Today they all get named as sick by the doctors. They give them some names. If you just leave them in nature, let them play, do a lot of physical activity, the body will adjust itself. But before that, they are already given a title as to what they are, ADH or this one or that one and they are medicated for this, which is a completely different approach, unfortunate approach, that every child is labeled before he finds his feet. <coughs> or another way of increasing the brain capacity is to increase the size of the neuron. If you increase the size of the neuron, right now as you sit here in a restful state, Twenty percent of your calories are burned by your brain. Those of you who've been thinking about calories, you just have to think a little more. Twenty percent of your energy is right now being consumed by your brain. It's such a small part compared to the rest of the body, but it is consuming twenty percent of the energy. It's a very high energy consuming 
part of your body. If you increase the size of the neuron, this physical body will not be capable of delivering the necessary energy that the brain will demand. So they said you cannot increase the brain capacity, but you can use it better. It's uncanny, after fifteen thousand years we say the same thing. And this is not because of neurological principles, this is because of physical laws in the universe. Physical laws are determined on this planet because of the structure of the solar system or what they're saying once again is, unless something about the solar system changes, you cannot change the structure of your brain or structure of your body. So in that sense, the solar system has a serious role to play at what speed it is spinning, how it is doing things, has a serious role to play in the way your body has shaped up, in the way your intelligence has shaped up, in the way the human being has evolved over a period of time. Considering this, there are three very important factors. There are nine important factors, we'll not go into that. The three most important factors are the planet, the sun and the moon. It is only because our mother's bodies were in sync with the cycles of the moon, we are even born, otherwise we wouldn't be born. Similarly, the cycles of the sun, which happens once in twelve and a quarter years, have similar impact on us, but that is not noticed by most people because it's twelve and a quarter years span. So the cycles of the sun and the cycles of the moon have a serious impact. The cycles of the moon have more a larger impact on the feminine of the nature. I'm not talking about male and female, I'm talking about masculine and feminine as two different qualities in nature. When I talk about this as masculine and feminine, not as male and female, male and female is just a byproduct of the masculine and the feminine nature which exists in nature. In the yogic system, you will see always a full-grown yogi means he is depicted as half man, his right hand side is man, the left hand side is a female body. He is always depicted like this, a full-grown yogi means both the masculine and feminine in him has grown to its fullest extent. The logical and the intuitive, the masculine and the feminine, the ability to conquer and the ability to embrace both of them have grown within him to its fullest capability. So, when we talk about the nature of human development on the planet, we have been at a stage where survival has been an issue for a long time. In our perspective, it's a long time, but in the life of the planet, a few thousand years is not a long time. In these few thousand years, survival has been the biggest issue. When survival is the biggest issue, masculine was most important, naturally. Procurement was most important. Fighting it out for every piece of bread was most important. Now, like never before, though still many areas of the world have to be handled, still like never before, our food and survival has been organized like never before, never before in the history of humanity was survival process as well organized as it is today. Today, if you have the money, you can go to the superstore and buy everything that you need for the next one year and not step out of your house for one year. This was not possible. Every day you had to go for water, every day you had to go out for food, every day you had to go out for everything. This is only in this generation that we are beginning to experience this. So this is the generation where slowly feminine can find its expression. My concern right now is, because we are a transiting generation from survival process to evolving into other dimensions of human potential and capability, here the feminine becomes important. And here it's very, very important that we do not mold success around masculine nature. Right now, if a woman wants to be successful, she has to be like a man, go get it. This has to change, our idea of success has to change so that it is not fitting into masculine mold where all women will become like men in some way to be successful. Because killing of the feminine is happening rampantly in the last uh, maybe twelve, fifteen hundred years. This has been an active process 
because somewhere we find feminine, we have misunderstood gentleness as weakness. We have misunderstood softness as uh, a useless process of life. Our idea of strength is like this. This has to go. Our idea of strength has to change. Our idea of success has to change. Our idea of what it means to… from conquest to inclusion, it has to happen. Right now, our idea of having something is to conquer that. If… if you conquer somebody, you can sit on top of their head, they may be… <laughs> they may be under your control in one dimension of life, but as long as you sit on somebody's head, you will always be at the risk of <laughs> not being able to leave that place one thing and always they will make sure your life is miserable. If you conquer somebody, the conquered people, they may not be able to get liberated, but they will make sure your life is miserable for sure. So if life has to happen beautifully, from conquest to inclusion, from masculine to feminine, the shift has to happen. I am not saying from male to female, I am insisting from masculine to feminine needs to happen. The feminine has to flower and flourish. A time has come for that because survival is not the biggest issue anymore. We can relax our masculine nature a little bit and allow the feminine to flower. If that answers your question, I'm sorry <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Sadhguru, what's your greatest passion? I'm sorry? What's your greatest passion? Oh. I do not know how not to be passionate about anything. <laughs> I'm sorry? Oh, I'm very passionate about them. Am I not speaking to you passionately? Am I speaking to you without involvement? See, passion essentially means involvement, isn't it? Hmm? Can you be passionate without involvement? No. Right now, people have understood passion as a unidimensional thing. A man and woman is sitting together, that is passion. No, you can be passionate with the whole universe, why not? Why are you passionate with one thing and not passionate with the other? It's a crime. It's a crime against humanity and life that your passion is limited to one or two things. Whatever you set your eyes upon right now, you must be absolutely involved with it, isn't it? If you're involved with it, there is a passion. And if your passion is not discriminatory, if your passion is universal, then you become compassion. Compassion means all-encompassing passion. Compassion doesn't mean kindness. Kindness is only useful for those who have fallen. Yes? Yes or no? For the sick and the dying, kindness is good. For one who is doing well, he doesn't want to be treated kindly or compassionately. He wants to be treated with passion, isn't it? <laughs> yes or no? Hello? The word passion is used in a very limited way, always referring to two people's engagement. No. How can you not be passionate about anything that you're in touch with? I'm talking in terms of the very air you breathe, the earth that you walk upon and everything else that is in touch with you right now. If you are not passionate, it essentially means you don't care a damn for what's around you, isn't it? Or no? If I'm not passionate with you, what it means is I don't care a damn for you. I've come here to deliver something. No, I'm not coming here to deliver anything. I'm here because I'm passionate about every piece of life. You, because you mentioned women, Can I tell you a bit of a story? Is it okay? Hello? Hello, I'm talking to you. <laughs> I had a great grandmother who lived up to 113, 113 years of age. <laughs> people, uh, those days, people said, she's a devil of a woman. <laughs> because <laughs> if she laughed, the whole street shook. In those days, a woman was not supposed to laugh loudly. I don't know how they managed to live with women who could not laugh. It must have been torturous. 
So she laughed in such a way that the whole street shook when she laughed. So people said she laughs like a devil. I was just four or five years of age. I thought, if the devil is the one who laughs, <laughs> somehow he seems to be more attractive to me. And she was more attractive to me than anybody around because she laughed in such a way. I saw her in all kinds of states. She would be laughing and crying at the same time, singing and dancing and laughing and crying. She was over hundred at that time. When I saw her, she had crossed hundred mark. And uh, I've seen these things happening. In the morning, people give her a breakfast. When she was sixty-eight years of age, after she buried her husband and many of her children and a few grandchildren, because she got married at fourteen, by sixty-eight she had seen everybody coming and going. <laughs> So she left the family, built a small place for herself with her own hands and lived there. When we went there for vacations to our ancestral home, she would always come to see the children. And when somebody gave her breakfast, she would just first take the breakfast to the ants, to the birds, to the squirrels and she would watch them eating. And there were people who were self-appointed advisors who said, you old woman, you don't eat anything, you will die one day. All these advisor, advisors died, but she continued to live. <laughs> I've seen her many times. She would just watch the ants eating the food and tears would be flowing. I thought she's just emotional about these ants. And when people said, why don't you eat? She would say, I'm full. I thought, this is some stupid emotion. It took me twenty-five years to experientially come to the same place where how you could be nurtured by things around you. It is not just the food that you eat which does things to you. It is the level of involvement and contact that you have with life which does things to you. You could be well nourished without eating anything for quite substantial amounts of time. She was a living example of that. So that's the first woman who made a big impression on me. And my mother, <laughs> I think in many ways uh, she played a very significant role, I didn't uh, handle it that way at that time. I remember as children, if we traveled somewhere, my mother did everything in the house, okay, she never involved herself in any economic activity as it is today, but uh, for the four of the siblings that we had, that we were, she did everything in the house, she stitched, she embroidered, she cooked and she worked. She was definitely the most valued person in the home, not because she brought money home, simply because she was home. Very easily I can imagine my life without my father, I can never imagine my life without her. So when we traveled, uh, she would look at the pillowcases and empty pillowcases, white sheets. She would say, how can children eat on empty pillowcases? And right there she would pull out or sewing needle and thread and she would make one tiny little flower or a green parrot on the pillowcase. I, I remember any number of nights when I'm lying down, that little green parrot sank so deep into my consciousness that somebody was always there placing someone else's life as a more important thing than her own life. I think that's the bedrock of my life today. I don't stitch green parrots, but I do similar things to people <laughs> all the time. And uh, then my wife, she was my like my shadow. And now many, many women around me, my daughter and many others, over seventy percent of uh, important positions in Isha Foundation are held by women. Not because they're women, I don't choose people by gender. I just go by their competence. What I see is if you provide a safe enough and a respectful enough space, a woman's creativity flowers wonderfully. A lot of her time is gone in life, just trying to look right, sit right, stand right. All her intelligence and her effort and her energy is gone in this in the world because she's already always seen as a showpiece. She's always trying to sit right, dress right, look right. A whole lot of energy and time is gone in this. If you take away this, 
if you just provide them a respectful and a safe place. I find they're doing wonderfully well, as I said, 70% of important positions in the foundation are held by the women, not because of their gender, simply because of their competence. And here I am with you today. <laughs> Sadhguru, speaking uh, about Isha Foundation, Isha Foundation is a 100% volunteer-led organization. How did you manage to involve more than 2 million volunteers in your projects and what is the significance of volunteering? Oh. The word volunteer literally means uh, one who is willing. If you're not willing for life, I don't know why the hell you're here. You must be willing. Are you a hundred percent yes for life? I'm asking you. Hello? Are you a one hundred percent yes for life? That means you're a volunteer. That means you must be doing things what you truly care for in your life, not some rubbish that somebody else values. So I made this impression on people that in your life you must be doing what you care for. You do not do anything that you don't care for. Because if you're doing some rubbish that you don't care for, your life is a wasted life. You need to understand, first of all, the most important thing that everybody needs to constantly remind themselves of is that you are mortal. That means you have an expiry date. That means it's ticking away right now. Yes or no? Oh, you don't like this? Whether it's you or me, right now, we may think we are going to many places, but actually we are rushing towards the grave. <laughs> this is a fact. If you are constantly aware of this, you will not have time to do anything other than what truly matters to you, isn't it? And every human being should be doing only that which truly matters to you. When I went to school, this was my biggest problem. My problem is, the teachers are talking about something that doesn't mean a damn thing to them and I don't want to listen to them. I'm not willing to listen to anybody if they're speaking about something. It doesn't matter how great the subject is. If it doesn't mean anything to them, I don't see why I should listen to it. It doesn't matter how simple a matter it is, if it means something to you, I'm willing to listen to it. <laughs> because if it doesn't mean anything to you, why are you even uttering it, first of all? This is always my question. So I went to school in a very strange condition. I must say something about this. <clears throat> when I was three, four years of age, I realized one thing. I suddenly realized I don't know anything. The people have misunderstood, I do not know. I do not know is the biggest possibility in your life. The most immense thing in your life is, I do not know. If you see, I do not know, the longing to know is inevitable. The seeking to know will follow, knowing will naturally happen out of this. So when I was about four, I suddenly realized I don't know anything. If somebody gives me a glass of water, I would not know what water is. I would simply be staring at water three, four hours at a stretch. Well, I knew that if I drink this water, it'll quench my thirst and different ways of using it. But even today, you do not know what water is, isn't it? It's the only thing present on this planet in all the three states. Two-thirds of the planet is water, two-thirds of your body is water. If we want to look for life, we look for a drop of water. But do we really know what it is? We know how to use everything. We do not know what it is. If we recognize that we do not even know a leaf, we would walk a little more gently and respectfully on this planet. Right now, we're in a wanton state of thinking that we know everything. <laughs> so when I realize I do not know anything, if I find a leaf, I'm staring at it. I sit up in my bed, whole night I'm staring at the darkness. My dear father, being a physician, started thinking that uh, I need psychiatric evaluation. His problem was, this boy is staring at something all the time. 
without blinking, he's staring, he's lost it. My problem is, I look at this, I still don't know this, how do I shift my attention to something else? I'm just stuck with this. So in this condition, they sent me to school. I went to school, my mother said, you must pay attention to the teacher. I just paid attention to the teacher. <laughs> the kind of attention that they had never received in their lives. I would know the teachers past, present and future, but what they were speaking, initially I could make out the meanings of the words. Suddenly one day I realized, they're only making noises or sounds and I'm making up the meanings in my head. See, even now, if you do not understand English, I'm only making sounds, isn't it? Language is a conspiracy between two people. If I make this sound, you make up that meaning. If I make another sound, you make up another me meaning. Suppose I start speaking in some other language, an Indian language that you do not understand, as far as you're concerned, it'll be just sounds, isn't it? So when I realized they're only making sounds, I'm making up the meanings, I stopped making the meanings. And suddenly it became such fun. See, this is a problem. The moment you don't understand something, most human beings do not pay attention. This is something we have to correct. What we do not understand needs more of our attention than what we think we understand, isn't it? If you pay absolute attention, you must do this. You turn on a Chinese channel today on the television, simply sit there with absolute attention. You will see after some time, it will become so amusing the whole human activity. So a big smile spread on my face, but the teachers were not amused at all with this. My education went like this. I remember when I was in my, uh, you know, in my school, every month, I don't know if you have such a system in Qatar, uh, monthly report cards, you have, your parents have to sign. Hmm? So when this day comes, I saw some children strutting around because they are first or second, some children crying, they are afraid to go home, like this. Never once did I ever open this report card. The teachers gave it to me, I took it and gave it to my father. I thought this is a transaction between my teacher and my father. I had nothing to do with it <laughs> because I consistently had six zeros in every report card. I gave an empty paper every time. If they insisted, I wrote my name, otherwise just an empty paper. So my education went like this, somehow passed the final exams, always went on. Five years ago or six years ago, the school where I studied over forty years ago, they came to invite me to their one hundred and twenty-fifth anniversary. The trustees of the school came to invite me and I said, see please, why me? I was not just a not good student, I was not even a student. Why are you inviting me? They said, no, no, our school has produced uh, federal ministers, our school has produced cricketing stars, film stars, all kinds of people. You are the only mystic, you have to come. <laughs> so I went. I went and stood up in the quadrangle to speak, same oppressive buildings. And I suddenly looked at this classroom and I remember, I was twelve years of age. One afternoon, as usual, I am paying absolute attention to the teacher. I can't hear a word that he says, but I know everything about him. So that afternoon, he's trying to get a response from me. After thirty-five, forty minutes of serious attempts to get a response from me, where those are days I wouldn't utter a word for three to four days at a, at a stretch because when you don't know anything, what do you say? I simply stare at everything. So he came and shook me violently like this and he said, you must either be the divine or the devil, I think you are the later. I was not abused by this or insulted by this, till that moment my problem was, I don't know what is this, what is that, what is that, what is that, everything created attention for me. I knew one thing, this is me, suddenly this man confused me about this also. Then I started looking, what the hell is this? I couldn't make out, so I closed my eyes initially for minutes, hours, days. One day I sat down with my eyes closed. 
I thought it was twenty-five, thirty minutes and when I opened my eyes, there was a crowd of people. India being what it is, garlands around me, people trying to pull my legs, somebody wants to know about his business, somebody wants to know when his daughters will get married, all kinds of rubbish that I had never imagined possible. <laughs> I said, well, how the hell did you come here? They said, you've been sitting here for thirteen days. In my experience, it felt like twenty-five to thirty minutes and big crowd had gathered, I had to leave the place because just to avoid these crowds. Why I'm telling you this is, life is in many more dimensions than you imagine possible. It is only in enhancing your perception, you will access it, not in making conclusions. This is one thing we have to bring into our children, that most of the universe that we live in, we do not know, a sense of wonder and interest in everything that's around us. Right now, we have idiotic conclusions about everything that we keep changing every twenty-five years. It's time we pay attention to the magnificent creation in which we are living. If we do this, all the other things that you're talking about will naturally fall into place. Because, see, the fight in the world, the conflict in the world is not between good and bad as people would like to project it. It is always between one man's belief or other man's belief. I believe this, you believe that, somebody else believes that, we are always fighting endlessly. If we wondered about everything around us, if we paid attention to everything, the universe will yield in a fantastic way. And if we live here for a million years, it can still keep you interested. <laughs> uh, we'll open the floor questions from the audience. Sir. The question right there. Where's the microphone? There's a question like right there. You did it, <coughs> huh? Yeah. She, she's getting you the, uh, the microphone. Hello. Okay, my name is Hala. I have a dream, it makes my heart sing. And I forget about it for six years. Sing or sink? Sing. Sing, okay. And I forget about it for six years, and two years back, I woke up thinking that I want to accomplish. Um, I made like a minor achievement, maybe it's a major to others, but I still have difficulties in achieving my dreams, and some look at me as if I'm insane or like I'm a big dreamer or whatever. Okay. So what my question for you, um, what signs like uh, maybe life gives you to believe more in your dream as if you are on the right track and you're going to accomplish it? Okay. Thank you. My. Blessing is, may your dreams not come true. I'll tell you why <laughs> See, uh, if your dreams are big enough, it will never get completed in one lifetime. Only if you have petty dreams, you can fulfill it in a few years. If you have a truly large dream, you know you will only take one step in your lifetime and somebody else will further it tomorrow. It will go on. <laughs> So may you have such dreams that it, they will never be fulfilled. But your life is beautiful because you're working for a dream, not because it will happen. It is just that if you can take a single step in a lifetime, that's a great thing. If your dream is large enough, so make your dream large enough so that your dreams are not fulfilled in this lifetime. Oh, will that make you miserable? That's the whole thing. This is the whole thing that we have not established. Right now, for most human beings, the song in their heart will die if some situation around them does not work out the way they think it should happen. You see any number of frustrated, depressed, beaten human beings simply because their inner experience is determined by what's happening around them. In the very nature of things, life is made in such a way that the outside will never happen hundred percent the way you want it. Even if you're just two people in the family, it still doesn't happen the way you want it, isn't it? 
if it's happening 51% your way, you have the controlling stake. 100% it never happens. Is it a fact for everybody's life? And it should be that way. Because if everything happens your way in this world, where do I go? Where does everybody else go? Something happens my way, something happens your way, something happens somebody else's way, it's fine. The world need not happen one hundred percent your way, it should not happen your way. But at least you as a person should happen hundred percent the way you want yourself to be, isn't it? This one person must happen hundred percent the way you want this person to be. If this one person happen hundred percent the way you want himself or herself to be, how would you keep this one, blissful or miserable? I'm asking you. See, what you want for yourself is definitely the highest level of pleasantness. What you want for your neighbor may be debatable, but what you want… <laughs> what you want for yourself is one hundred percent clear, the highest level of pleasantness. If pleasantness happens in your body, we call it health. If it becomes very pleasant, we call it pleasure. If your mind becomes pleasant, we call it peace. If it becomes very pleasant, we call it joy. If your emotions become pleasant, we call it love. If it becomes very pleasant, we call it compassion. If your very life energies become pleasant, we call this bliss. If it becomes very pleasant, we call it ecstasy. If your surroundings become pleasant, we call it success. This is all you want in your life, isn't it? Success is the only thing. The outside pleasantness is determined by many forces, not just by you. All of them must cooperate to create outside pleasantness. But to create inner pleasantness, you don't need anybody's cooperation, just you, isn't it? This one thing, if you make it happen, then you would na naturally enlarge your dream in such a way, it cannot be fulfilled in one lifetime. The fear of suffering is what is making people dream small, think small, work small, because I dream big and if it doesn't happen, what will happen to me? I will become miserable. If you have an assurance, whatever happens, this is how I will be. You would dream really big, isn't it? I must tell you a small example. They were on the video showing the project Green Hands. In the year 1998, some experts from United Nations came to southern India and they made a prediction by 2025, sixty percent of southern India will be a desert. Maybe you don't mind that living in Doha, but when they said a desert, a desert is a bad word in southern India. <laughs> A desert means a horrible place. <laughs> a desert means life cannot sustain itself. So, when they said desert, I wanted to look at this because South India has a history of twelve thousand years of agriculture. People have been tilling the same land for twelve thousand years. And in one generation, we're going to turn it into a desert. I didn't like the idea. I wanted to see and I traveled around just to see if it's true. And then I found it won't go till 2025, it may happen much sooner than that. I saw… I tried to look at what is the… I'm not some kind of an environmental expert or something. I just saw what is the big problem? Why is it going to become a desert? One thing was there was not enough green cover in the state where we are. The national aspiration is thirty-three percent green cover. And Tamil Nadu had only sixteen point five percent green power, uh, green cover. So I made a simple barefoot calculation. If you plant one hundred and fourteen million trees in eight to ten years, in fifteen to twenty years, we will have thirty three percent green cover. So I called a bunch of volunteers and told them, let's plant hundred and fourteen million trees. Their eyeballs rolled. I said, Sadhguru, do you know what is hundred and fourteen million? hundred and fourteen million trees, how are we going to plant? Then I asked them, what is the population of the state? They said, sixty-two million. I said, if all of us plant one tree today, take care of it for two years and plant one more, you got the number. Even a beggar 
So it can plant one, isn't it? Hmm? All of us are using it. Why is it that all of us are not participating in making it happen? So we went about, first six years I spent planting trees in people's minds, which is the hardest terrain to plant, believe me <laughs> And once this successfully happened, today we have planted over seventeen million trees, it's a failure because it's not hundred and fourteen. Seventeen million trees in nine years we planted the green cover in Tamil Nadu. It's the only place in whole of Asia where the green cover is going up, it's gone up by seven point two percent in a matter of nine years. And above all, people have now taken it up everywhere. It's become a huge movement. We did not give up our lives to make this happen. This is just one small thing that I invested a certain amount of time. One thing I did with people, I made the farmers and the village people assemble in one place, made them sit under a tree and close their eyes and told them, see what you exhale the tree is inhaling, what the so you are inhaling. This is a relationship that you can't do without. You just have to take care of this and that's it. <laughs> they all got fired up. But this is a failed dream because hundred and fourteen million trees, where is seventeen million, where is hundred and fourteen million? I'm telling you, if you have a really big dream, it'll always be a failure and that's wonderful. Hello, um, good afternoon, I'm Mr. Sandguru. Uh, my name is Asil. I'm from Bahrain. I'm an entrepreneur. I have, I don't have a question, I might have a comment to what you said. Um, I do agree, we need to think and we need to meditate, but um, success can be achieved only through um, hard work, realization, thanking God, and measures of success only your determination of your success. Nobody can tell you how successful you are. There's no measure, there's no parameter. Um, in every leadership course that I go to, they ask me to, t to think outside the box, reach for the sky, um, go out there, but we are human beings and we are limited. So there's no such thing as sky is the limit because other people, I live in a, in, a, in a planet with other people, so there is limitations to what I can do. And the time limitation, effort limitation, and it's a choice. It's you choose where to be. I think that. Uh, I think that God had created every person with a calling. There's a reason why we're here. This is what I believe as an entrepreneur. I don't know if you would disagree with me or that. Sometimes, um, Things are inside the box, so why should I be looking outside the box unless I find all the answers in the box? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, no, I think uh, that is a… I know a lot of talk is going about this everywhere in the business meetings and stuff. I think it's a little misunderstood, misunderstood concept. When they talked about outside the box, they were only talking about thinking outside the box not uh, working outside the box. We all work within certain boundaries because our physical capabilities and our energies and time are limited, so we do work within some boundaries. But we were talking about thinking outside the box. Thinking outside the box as a term became popular because people were thinking in traditional ways within the limitations of their social and other exposure. Thinking outside the box is only talking about being exposed to a larger world and being a, a small community of people. So uh, it does not mean that you go do business in the sky, okay, unless you're Qatar Airways. Good afternoon. How challenging is for uh, people to find their inner peace and how do they know that they reach it? It is not challenging. It is just because uh, they have not done the right things within themselves that peace seems to be such a big thing. These days, uh, everybody is talking about being peaceful as the ultimate goal in their life. Even the so-called spiritual leaders are talking about peace being the ultimate goal. But I'll ask you a simple question with all due regard to all of them. Tell me, could you enjoy your lunch today if you were not peaceful? Hello? No. So enjoying your lunch, is it the highest achievement in your life, I'm asking? 
If you have a dog at home, you throw something that he likes, he will eat joyfully, isn't it? What's the human problem? We can't sit joyfully, we can't eat joyfully, we can't do anything properly because we have been given an intelligence that we have still not learnt how to handle, isn't it? It's an evolutionary problem. From goat becoming a giraffe, I don't know, she is the genetic expert, she must tell me how many million years she took. From a pig becoming an elephant, it took millions of years. But a monkey becoming a human being happened pretty quick to a point that we think that there is a missing link somewhere. It's an evolutionary problem. Suddenly, we are endowed with a certain dimension of intellect and we don't have a stable enough platform for that. Unless you create one, you will see you not being peaceful, you being stressed, you being miserable essentially means your own intelligence is working against you. Yes or no? Your intelligence is not working for you, it is working against you. Any other creature on this planet, please see stomach full, they're peaceful. Human being, <laughs> stomach empty only one problem, stomach full one hundred problems. <laughs> because you're not able to handle your intelligence. What is a phenomenal gift to you has become a problem because you have not created a stable enough platform to operate this intelligence. It's something that every human being needs to work at. Being peaceful is not even an issue. There are many ways to understand this. I know, let me not make a ridicule out of this. There are many ways to understand this. See, suppose you lose your peace today, who, who gets the first dose? Somebody in your family, they get the first dose of you not being peaceful, isn't it? If it continues tomorrow, you may pick a quarrel with your neighbor. If it continues tomorrow, you may end up fighting on the street with somebody. If it continues tomorrow, you go to your workplace and yell at your boss. The moment you yell at your boss, everybody needs… everybody knows that you need medical attention. When you screamed at your family, they thought it's normal. But if you scream in a place where it's going to have serious consequences for you, everybody knows that you need medical attention. If they take you to your doctor, initially he tries to talk you out of it, it usually doesn't work, so he throws a pill into you. A little pill if you take, you become peaceful. Maybe not forever, for a certain amount of time. What is a pill? A little bit of chemicals. It is making you peaceful or in other words, what you call as peace is a certain kind of chemistry. What you call as joy is another kind of chemistry. What you call as ecstasy is another kind of chemistry. Agony is another kind of chemistry. Misery is another kind of chemistry. Stress and every, every human experience has a chemical basis to it. Now I am talking about a technology through which you can create the right kind of chemistry, a chemistry of blissfulness.